Welcome to the Society for American Soccer History's SASH session, a flash session, because it was only announced last weekend uh, with Pablo Maurer and Matt Pence. I'm Tom McCabe, president of the Society. Pablo is a staff writer at the Athletic who loves to delve into the nooks and crannies and idiosyncratic aspects of American soccer culture and history. So does Matt, who has covered soccer in this country for over a decade. Pablo and Matt have co-researched and co-authored an amazing article on We Willie McLean, a Scottish immigrant who became a Midwest soccer legend. He went to Italy for the second ever World Cup in 1934 with the United States national team. Then in the ensuing years, We Willie disappeared. More on that later. But before we get to Pablo and Matt's amazing, compelling portage, a bit about our society, of which Pablo, Pablo is a member. Founded in 1993, SASH works to promote, facilitate, and disseminate research into the rich history and heritage of soccer in the United States. You can find us on the web at ussoccerhistory.org, and at social media, on Facebook, and our Join SASH tab also our Twitter accounts. Uh, please join us uh, on that tab uh, and go to our website for any information. Now back to our guests who took uh, two years to research and report this story. We'll talk to them about this project um, and then talk about questions, comments that you might have. I'm gonna employ a little biblical phrase here. Uh, the Lord draws straight with crooked paths. And if there was ever a story uh, where that was true, uh, <laughs> what's the genesis of this engrossing tale and what uh, sorts of twists and turns and crooked paths uh, did you discover along the way? So I'll turn it over uh, to our guest today and thank you for joining the society. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Um, Matt can speak to this as well. I got to give Matt credit. I think, if I think really hard, I think he was probably the first one on that Willie McLean Wikipedia page. I mean, it, it's pretty simple. I think COVID came along and sort of uh, derailed, obviously, live soccer for a good while. Um, so, uh, you know, I think Matt and I were both kind of brainstorming uh, ideas for historical pieces. And I told Matt, you know, I've, I've done a lot on you know, whatever the NASL or the MLS, et cetera, but had never really sort of dived into um, a really truly early US national team history. And I think much has been written about the 30 uh, World Cup squad, 50 as well, obviously 30 being the first, 50 being um, the team that memorably obviously upset, upset England. Um, so we just started looking through the names of players in the 34 World Cup uh, team and obviously arrived at Wee Willie and uh, very quickly found out that apparently he dropped off the face of the earth and Wikipedia said he was, you know, at no death date and listed him as being alive at 117. Uh, so that's the kind of thing that piques your interest, I think. Yeah, and we had, uh, as Pablo kind of said, it was uh, September of 2020. Um, so a good six months into the first pandemic year. And and yeah, and at first it was kind of, I wouldn't call it nice because everything was so in flux, but as somebody who likes writing feature stories, it had kind of given us the flexibility to kind of run through those stories that you like never had the time to do. So there was a lot of freedom in those early months, uh, but you get six months in and, and it's like you start to kind of reach the end of your notebook to an extent um, without live events really going on, at least not to the extent that they were before. Um, and so, yeah, so on Wikipedia, like it was literally like the 1930 and 1934 World Cup teams were just going through one by one, clicking through the link to the guy, trying to figure out what might be going on. Because as Pablo kind of alluded to, we wanted to write about somebody on those early teams, but it was also like it was a very tumultuous time in the world. I mean, as we kind of get into in Willie's story, I mean, anyone who played on those 30, 34 World Cup teams, it was a uh, a very interesting time to be alive. And I kind of figured that somebody in there would have a story worth exploring and telling that had maybe been a little bit lost, although maybe not nearly as lost as, as Willie kind of ended up being. So that was kind of the genesis, literally clicking through the rosters of the 1930 and 1934 World Cup teams one by one, seeing if anything piqued our interest. And yeah, I think, I think too, if you read the Wikipedia, I mean, it's so much 
so much of the sort of modern media that's produced, if you think about Netflix or Hulu um, or long form writing has this sort of true crime kind of aspect to it. And even the little sort of breadcrumbs that were on his Wikipedia that he just disappeared without the tra a trace and, you know, sent postcards from up and down the Mississippi, that sort of stuff. Uh, as a consumer of all that modern trash, this, this really appealed to both of us, I think. Um, you know, so we, I think very quickly we fell down the rabbit hole. And then a, a brief follow-up there would be, you know, what, what were your findings once you zeroed in on uh, this character? You know, how did the many facets, what were some of the, the, the great discoveries? Could you walk us through, you know, kind of once you've, you know, honed in on Wee Willie, how, how that research developed? And I know there's at least one member of our society who, uh, you know, helped along the way. So, yeah, but please elaborate on that. I know our, our members will will uh you know really enjoy that yeah it was sort of start with the basics and i guess i'll just give a generic spoiler alert here if you haven't read the piece i'm just going to ruin the whole thing for you but um you can still go read it i mean the basics are you know he played at the for, for sticks baron floor in st louis for the bricklayers shamrocks in st louis bricklayers in chicago just a bunch of dominant club sides goes to the 34 world cup uh, has a breakdown in 36, according again to sort of what limited information is available, and then just drops off the face of the earth a year or two later. Um, so we started, you know, uh, Willie had a nephew, Archibald McKinley, who happened to be um, a local newspaper writer in Indiana. And he had written an article in 1994 that just sort of, uh, you know, gave us a starting point, but also kind of deepened the mystery. I mean, it basically went over his career exploits, but then just sort of skipped his entire life and said, you know, it said like we buried Willie and Uncle Willie in Calumet Park in 1977 or something like that. Um, uh, so we started from there. I mean, we just sort of constructed his family tree. Um, I think probably after a week or two, we did get frustrated by the fact that very few, few of Willie's family members wanted to touch this. There was very little information um, available on him. So we sort of uh, roped James Brown uh, here into our research. And, you know, very quickly, he, I, I would say James provided a couple of things that kind of were like keys to unlocking dozens of other things. I mean, one of them being a burial notice, which verified that, yeah, this guy, you know, died in 1977 is interred, you know, in Illinois. Um, and the other being, and you know, possibly most uh, important in that burial notice, you know, that listed that he had a surviving daughter who just miraculously is still alive at 90 um, and agreed to talk to us. Um, I don't know, Matt, you want to take it from here? Yeah, um, it, it definitely, it was one of those stories that kind of unfolded. There were definitely kind of like twists along the way, as you kind of alluded to in our intro there. Um, that yeah, we, James was really integral in helping us build out the family tree and also to just sort of like get information and start reaching out to people. Um, it's kind of blind firing off Facebook messages and cold calls and voicemails that never got returned and and all that stuff and it almost felt like every time uh, we started to reach a dead end uh, something else would pick up like we got in touch with Archibald McKinley who was the um, newspaper columnist um, his widow he, he had passed away but his widow is still alive and got in touch with her and, and she was excited to talk to us but was pretty much like yeah I don't know anything about this person really uh, she had a couple different um, kind of like photographs that Archie had kept. Most prominently, the, the main photo of the art of our story was this photo negative of Willie um, from when he played for the Bricklayers. And it's just this beautiful photo, um, really crystal clear, that kind of gave us that first glimpse of him. But beyond that, she didn't have a lot. And so it just ended up being we would get, I, I still remember getting a call from what would have been Willie's great niece, Kimberly, um, I was just like driving. I live in Seattle and I was like driving on a Seattle street and had to like pull off to the side and talk to her. And she had kind of given us our first hint that there was some kind of, of mental breakdown involved. And she kind of had referenced it, referenced him kind of being around and that the family was vaguely aware that, that Uncle Bill was still out there somewhere. But 
that it was just this thing that you didn't talk about back then and it was kind of regarded as this like sort of shameful family secret um that then kind of allowed us to unlock a lot of the rest and yeah and and once we got nancy involved that was obviously a huge part um pablo was able to go and, and sit with her um and willie's grandchildren as well um, yeah i, mean, and that I think really, like i you know, just to interject matt i also think when it comes to nancy in particular we got really lucky right because this is a woman who you know her father willie mclean I mean, it, it, like, it, it sounds like a hackneyed, like almost stereotypical, but it, the, the guy literally went out for a pack of cigarettes and never came back. That's what actually happened. And um, she last saw him when she was two. And I think to a lot of people that would create a lot of resentment, but I think it worked to our favor a little bit here because once um, I earned Nancy's trust, you know, she didn't really have much of an attachment to Willie. And it wasn't like she felt horrendously betrayed i mean he was just never a part of her life so i think she was really as curious as we were you know we we got really really lucky in that respect because um you know it it would have also been so easy for me to go there and her just to tell me to pound sand you know um but yeah i mean once we sat with her she she confirmed that you know he vaporized and then you know sort of we talked, you know, I, I talked to her for maybe 20, 30 minutes. And right as I was leaving, she said, she sort of drops this bombshell that that he had actually sort of like suggested to um, his wife, Nancy's mother, that, you know, they enter into like a murder-suicide pact and the three of them all die together. I think from that, you know, from that point on, it became, um, it became like every single thing we found out about this guy was more gray and muddy and complex than what we'd already learned, you know? Yeah, and it was another sort of example of the pieces falling together um, in a way that, I don't know, kind of compelled us to move forward because if, if Nancy had been our first stop and we had gotten that information first and, and that was kind of it, maybe we would have even kind of like stopped from there. It was kind of an open and shut, like this happened, he abandoned his family. There was this very dark, the suicide pack thing is sort of unredeemable type story. But because we had talked to family members, we had found a lot of old newspaper references to him getting carried off the field and, and suffering concussions and being out for weeks and weeks with head injuries. It's, we had kind of uncovered what would maybe be considered some level of extenuating circumstances when it comes to why he might have disappeared. It's a very serious mental illness. Um, that, that kind of compelled us to keep digging and keep moving forward and allowed us to maybe keep being interested in his life, whereas those, those revelations from Nancy were obviously very heavy um, and tough to digest at the time. Yeah, so, and we also, like, something else James contributed, we ended up working with the Scott County Genealogical Society, um, and they chased down two other very important things. One was Willie's death certificate, and the other was a divorce decree. Um, so, Willie's death certificate really, really opened up, uh, up things because that's, uh, you know, where we discovered that he changed his name. You know, the name that was listed on his death certificate was William Stuart Lang, AKA McLean, right? So I feel like it sort of opened up this entire second half of our research where now we were chasing an entirely different ghost, right? Um, using that, we found out, you know, I found a newspaper listing, uh, obviously back in the 40s, 50s, whenever, you know, something like a divorce would be listed in the newspaper. Um, so we, I found a divorce listing um, for William Stewart Lang, uh, you know, his new name. Uh, we got a hold of that divorce decree. I noticed that it was delivered to him at Mount Pleasant Mental Health Institute in Iowa. So at that point, we that's when we determined he'd been institutionalized. It's just a huge snowball that kind of keeps building, right? I get a hold then of the Iowa Department of Health. They, you know, I get somebody on the phone who says, you know, you're not gonna believe this, but we have like, I have a roll of microfiche from this patient from, you know, 1946. Um, and she said, I have no idea if there's anything on it. Like a lot of this microfiche has degraded over the years, you know, um, and like given the way our research was going, I think Matt and I fully expected her to load that thing in and for it to all be black or washed out, you know? But um, again, Nancy signed, you know, Nancy is Willie's next of kin. She signed off on us getting the health records. And it was like easily the biggest thing, the, the thing that really made this story easiest to write from a research perspective were 
uh, Willie's admissions paperwork from from Mount Pleasant because it was just you know they interviewed him about his whole life. I mean, he just told his story in his own words. You know that you know back, all the way back to the first breakdown, all the way back to the beginning, basically to his to his childhood and in Clydebank, Scotland. And I mean, it's just, it's crazy. Um, I think probably what I'll do is I, I didn't want to put this on, um, you know, just stick in the piece or on Twitter, but I, I'm certainly happy to share with uh, society members, you know, just that mental health record because it's, it's just a crazy read on its own, you know? Yeah, and just the level of detail. Um, I've had people who read the story just kind of ask where, how we were able to get the level of, of detail that was in there and so much of it came from from that paperwork and to give Pablo some credit in, in terms of building that trust and that relationship with Nancy the story never would have happened if she wasn't willing to like completely trust two relative strangers with like very sensitive information um, and so that that I think was the thing that really made the story was getting that admissions paperwork because the level of detail in his in his own words is very heartbreaking it's very I mean it even gets into the fact that like he liked playing ping pong at, at the mental health facility and listening to certain types of music. And it was so granular that it really allowed us for the first time to really kind of fill in the blanks on this person who had been kind of a phantom to us, even kind of far into this process. I think too, sorry to prattle on, but like, and I, I imagine many of you have the same experience doing research, but a story like this where you're dealing with this whole family, um, in a way, it gets easier as as time moves on because if you treat people with respect and you earn their trust, um, they became the, you know Nancy and Constance and others became kind of the people who'd vouched for us to other members in the family. You know, I don't know that that anybody else would have spoken to us had they not been encouraged to by you know three or four different um, members of both sides of Willie's family that we got close to. Um, so yeah, it's it was it was an incredibly rewarding sort of reporting experience. I'm going to open it up uh, to others. Uh, we can use the raise hand, or or you can speak up because I know there are going to be some others that uh, you know will want to you know comment, you know share. You know, I mean, it's remarkable that you had that that document that that unlocks so much. There's so much of. American history, you know, especially early American soccer history, where you just don't have the documentation. I know that's something that uh, we all struggle with. And then when we find something, you know, that can tell, you know, more of the story, then then it's just, a, you know, an unbelievable source. So I'll, I'll uh, let somebody else uh, chime in, please. Well, if I can just, uh, I just want to thank Pablo and Matt for uh, for coming to sash and, and uh, asking for you know, a bit of help. Or, um, and this is exactly what I love to do. You know, I love going to chase all those little, little hints of the little things that you read in articles or that you dig up from other, uh, other branches of family members, uh, especially when you use those genealogy websites uh, or just article details. Uh, and Willie was always a fantastic, he was that little guy that was, had a very big impact on many championship teams. But, you know, he was not taken on to the uh, 1930 World Cup team because it was feared that his height, his lack of height, um, wouldn't fare well on the world stage. You know, um, and seeing that picture of the, the 1930 trial scene uh, with Willie there was absolutely uh, phenomenal. And um, I just love being able to, to exchange, go back and forth with Pablo and Matt. And, uh, and I was just at it 12 hours a day, you know, for however long I could be <laughs> of assistance, you know? And I would try and make calls. And, and you know, I think those, you know, the death certificate and the divorce decree um, those were so much fun to, to finally get a hold of and to be able to open up another avenue for these guys to go down. So, uh, Yeah, James, we, we had originally written the piece, so it's funny that there, there was a line that said that you were so enthusiastic about this that we thought that you might 
I think the exact uh, line was take our football and run with it. <laughs> so you definitely, uh, your, your help was appreciated. And it's funny um, what you said about uh, that photo. I think Matt and I both, there's a three line in the story about sort of the power of physical artifacts. I think also something that kept us going is, you know, find like something like finding that 34 World Cup patch at the archives on the floor or Nancy uh, giving me that uh, side note to the story, uh, the Willie family actually gave me that 1933 National Challenge Cup pendant that's in the story, which is now in the Hall of Fame archives. I, I mean, I would have loved to keep it, but it just seemed like it had some significant hall, you know, historical value and it, it would just sit on my shelf with all the other soccer ephemera that's here, but you know, stuff like that. Um, that I think that's in a way why it was important for us to go to his grave site. It was just sort of like the the final physical artifact in the story. Um, but little things like that kind of kept us going, you know. Um, but yeah, but no, uh, certainly thank you for your help. The, the, the story, frankly, probably doesn't happen without you, you know. So, so we're we're thankful. Yeah. I see Chuck Carlson with his hand. Chuck out of Chicago. Hello, thank you very, very much. It's a fantastic uh, article and fantastic research. Um, my question is in his um, mental health records and in his other records, did he talk a lot about soccer and the role soccer played in his life? Uh, his teammates, uh, the teams he played on, anything like that? And then secondly, more specific, Midwest Soccer News. Is that an available resource? Uh, I'll, I'll take the first one, Matt, maybe you could take the second one. The, the first one, it's sort of hilarious because and we write this in the piece. I mean, there is not one mention of soccer in those 14 pages, uh, you know, of his mental health records. I mean, the, the funny thing is you have all these records and then you have a handwritten, hand dated note on the, at the base of the first page from a doctor who literally at 19... 49 i think three years after his mission only then learned that this guy was a world cup soccer player you know i don't know if willie didn't mention it i mean obviously um the media landscape back then was much different it's not like anybody probably would have just known instinctively that this guy was uh you know had featured for the national team and was you know a dominant club player but it was it was incredible i mean soccer really disappeared from Willie's life after 1937. I and mean, we talked about it in the piece where even in the media, it's like he has this breakdown. There are sort of rumors of him coming back to play for teams in St. Louis. And then you just get references in the dispatch in the St. Louis paper. Probably once every 10 years, you get a sports writer who's like, you know, uh, X, X player is a promising winger, but he's no Willie McLean. You know, that's sort of like the extent of how you hear about him, but no, there, there's nothing in the records about his, um, about his soccer playing career at all. I will say in relation to his relationship with teammates, you know, um, I still would love to talk to Alec McNabb's family. So, you know, a, a fellow Scott who was on those teams, because from what I gather, um, Willie and him were close, you know, um, we would hear, all kinds of things that we couldn't put in the piece because we couldn't fact check them. I mean, one of one of Willie's family members said that you know we we were able to establish that Willie was assaulted in the street in 19 I want to say 28 or something like that. He was hospitalized, and one of his family members told us she said, "Yeah, you know, I think he got involved in like a love triangle with one of his teammates and their wife, you know, and that was you know his teammates beat him up, right? And again, from like a storytelling perspective, you're like salivating, but Nobody else had any idea what she was talking about. So, you know, I, I don't know. Um, and your second question, what was it for Matt? Uh, the Midwest Soccer News. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, they, so there are binders that like physically exist at the archives um, in North Carolina. But in terms of it being anywhere else, I mean, we we uploaded a page or two. We're happy to share like the, some of it was in the story. Uh, some of it, I'm sure that we can share the stuff that we uploaded, but yeah, they literally exist in this like pile of like dusty binders, like in one of the boxes at the archive. Yeah, um, it's one know. of one of many uh, things that should be digitized eventually, you know. Um, and they're like, Matt and I just sort of sat, I mean, found the ad, but we sort of sat there for 30 minutes and probably just read pages because the whole, you know, the all the issues are sort of these 
incredible time capsules of, you know, the years around World War II and, um, you know, nearby, I think I found a stack of uh, 45s, vinyl records that were, um, I want to say, sent to troops in the Korean War. And it was just soccer news from the United States. They pressed on these records and sent overseas. And I digitized a couple of those, you know, it's like fascinating to listen to. So, yeah, um, maybe one of these days I'll get around again down there with a scanner and just just run through a couple binders, you know, but um, hopefully the Hall of Fame gets on that sooner and later. Not holding my breath. <laughs> and then, yeah, and then just to kind of add quickly on what Pablo was saying about the records. And yeah, I mean, it was very clear that even for Willie, there was very much that like first chapter, second chapter of his life. And in the soccer aspect, it, it just seemed like he had, whether it was difficult for him to look back on sort of like the glory years of his life, given how far he had fallen or whether he was just so far removed at that point. Um, it kind of gets to like what is most important to people in that like the things he fixated on were his family and, and his family from back home and his parents who had passed away and also Nancy, um, even in his letters later in his life, it was those those relationships were the things that came through in his concern in his interviews um, in soccer by that point, which was what, I guess more than 10 years since he had played um, in 1946. It was very clear that that had kind of receded for him to an extent. And just let you guys know, I'm still working on the, on the McNabb uh, angle, trying oh, to get relatives overseas. So yeah. on this side of the bond. Uh, David Kilpatrick. I'm just uh, curious if you could say anything about uh, Willie's playing career. If he came over to the States as a teenager, um, he's from West Dunbartonshire. Uh, just wondered if you could, you know, any connections with the clubs that he, he played with in Scotland before he came over here? I mean, we, if, if I'm being totally honest, I don't think we, um, we dug too deeply and, uh, um, you know, his involvement with soccer in Scotland, obviously he came, the first team he played for in the States was uh, Pullman, um, played for the Bricklayers, obviously Six Square and Fuller, Shamrock, Central Breweries, et cetera. But um, I, I can't say that we dug into his, uh, his soccer career in Scotland at all. I mean, I think a lot of that too is, uh, I'm sure, you know, when you write a piece like this, it becomes a thing where, I'm not saying there's like editorial mandate, but, um, certainly it was like, I feel like we had to fight for every soccer detail that's in the piece um, because, you know, the outlet that's publishing it and the editors that are editing it fully realize that what's going to appeal to most readers is the disappearance, what happened to him after that, that sort of stuff. But no, like factually, David, I couldn't even tell you how Willie got to start in Scotland as far as soccer goes, you know, the only things we know about his childhood there are from his mental health records although like my my research personally and matt's i'm sure too is still ongoing like one of his family members and this is maddening <laughs> one of his family members who was like hesitant to talk to us for the piece that and then she ended up you know providing us with some handwritten correspondent of willies and some other stuff after the piece run says oh you know i didn't want to I didn't want to share this with you guys, but the piece was great. And I have a whole binder of letters that Willie's written to family members. And she has binders of family correspondence back to like the late 1800s, right? So this is the kind of things like Matt and I will, are, we have it in our head that we want to do a book on this. And, you know, and like that obviously would open up a lot more room to really more thoroughly dig into like his early years and stuff like that. So hopefully we'll, we'll come upon that down the road. Yeah. And, and I mean, he immigrated whenever he was 19. Um, and so he very much, it was sort of the beginning of his career to an extent you can sort of safely say, and given kind of hard, how hard scrabble his upbringing was, I, I don't know that it would have been a case that he was coming up through a certain team's academy or anything like that. I, it did kind of seem like he was naturally talented, but I, I think it's fair to say that he very much sort of like blossomed once he got to the States. I, I honestly think because he's not, he was 19 when he came over. I mean, if he was 16 or 17, maybe, but, you know, there's still a lot of McLean's in, in 
Milgawi and in Clyde Bank, West Dunbartonshire, that's where Kilpatrick is. You know, mm-hmm. so I know that I know the village pretty well. It's just outside of Glasgow. Lots of football clubs there. So if he came over as a 19 year old, he must have been uh, with the juniors of, of some club there. He, he had to. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I part, I don't know that. Our, I just, go ahead, man. Yeah. That's because part of the struggle, you hit on part of the struggle of our some of our research about connecting <laughs> colleges. That there are a lot of William McLeans. Uh, whatever you look back through and try to comb through all those details, that was definitely a struggle. Of there's, there's the the murderer, the murderer, right? I think his mom lives in Clyde Bank. William yeah. McLean, I'm a Hibs fan, so yeah, you can run into a lot of dead ends. No pun intended. <laughs> uh, Dad, you have a, a question. If you do, you have to unmute your unmute your your microphone. I can't hear you. Okay. Does anybody else have any other questions? How's that? Oh, there we go. Okay. There we you go. Got I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, look, I, I actually didn't have a question, but I wanted to tell you when Jim sent me that article, I, I literally couldn't stop uh, reading it. Not only was the, the research and the detail superb, but the writing was superb. Uh, it, it was a real pleasure. It was one of the finest pieces of writing that I've ever come across. Uh, so uh, uh, my observation is well done. <laughs> and when your book comes out, I'll be the first to purchase it. <laughs> and and please hurry up because I don't think I have a lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, George. All of that. It's, it's an honor to, to hear that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Yeah, about the writing, by the way, I think it was a struggle for Matt and I too. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm sure many of you struggle with this. Um, the piece was 16,000 words initially. It's, I think it ended at 10,000. And um, we had to cut it. it. It was just too long. And I think when you fall so far down the rabbit hole, it's really easy to assume that every reader is there with you and they're going to be fascinated by every little detail that, you know, because Matt and I got to the point where you'd find out what color sweater this dude was wearing and we'd be screaming to each other on the phone and excitement about it you know what I mean but um a, a lot I mean a lot got left on the cutting room floor what comes to mind for me is um the his whole stay at Mount Pleasant Mental Health Center I read two books one was like a 400 page and a 700 page book on one was just an academic text basically on the history of these four publicly run state mental health facilities in Iowa. The other one was more closely focused on um, one particular ward in the hospital while Willie was there. So, you know, I read those books to gather color and stuff like that. I, I also went to the mental hospital, but you know, 95% of that stuff ended up getting cut in edits. <laughs> so it's just one of those things. There's only so much room, you know, there's so much more of his story that's still untold. It's just not, not in the piece, you know. Your closing was superb. The, the, the final line in your article with, and the picture of the gravestone. Yeah. I, I, yes. I, that was, that was Matt's that. I think you staged that one, Pablo. I didn't. <laughs> that that's was why such... I took a video. I had to take the video because I swear to God, it was that's <laughs> how it actually played out, you know. Um, <laughs> Uh, and the writing was that writing in that kicker was Matt, so I got to give him the credit on that one. We're a good team. Yeah, yeah. On any others, uh, we're we're uh, approaching the end of the first half here. We're about thirty-seven minutes in. <laughs> we're only going one half, by the way. Don't worry. <laughs> hey, uh, uh, Tom. Excuse me. I, I I have to leave. Thank you very much. It was I thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks, George. Thank Thanks you, George. George. I have a question. Is there is there any possibility that you can uh, that you would be able to 
turn this into some type of Netflix or Amazon. <laughs> I mean, Matt and I had yeah. probably big, big dreams when we started <laughs> writing this piece. Um, but the, you know, the athletic works with like a literary pack, packing it, packaging agent, excuse me, sort of shops that stuff around. So, you know, it certainly has like all the hallmarks of, of one of those stories. Right. But, um, but I don't know. Um, I guess we'll see. It's, it's really tough, man. I think both of us hoped that this thing would kind of light the world on fire if for no other reason. So people would just see Willie's story and read it um, because it's, it's important in other ways, but yeah, it could be really tough to just get someone to read a story about a soccer player from a hundred years ago. It's just like one of those things. It's not the sexiest thing to peg a story around. <laughs> you know what I mean? So like, um, hopefully somebody sees it and has the same thought as, uh, as you did, or at least thinks, you know, hey, these guys should, should write more about this or write a book, because I think that would be very useful, you know? Um, yeah, we'll, we'll see. I'll, I'll add uh, a comment here. I had a professor uh, in grad school, Gerald Grob, who wrote a history of mental health, mostly up and down the East Coast. He looked like uh, Jack Kevorkian. Um, and then an advisor who was working on a project, cross generations, a family history, if you will, of cognitive history. So when I read this piece, you know, I was thinking about, you know, the mental health and the history of that, as well as, you know, cognitive, you know, family history. Um, could you elaborate on that? You know, you know, and, and maybe that was an unexpected, you know, well that you went into and learned so much about. I know you, you said you've read these institutional histories and such. But I, I find that to be a really fascinating part of, of this story. It's not just a soccer story, right? Yeah, it's funny how things intersect. I did a story about seven or eight years ago on, on this Dr. Walter Freeman, who, uh, who trained at St. Elizabeth's Hospital here in DC, which was the first federally run uh, mental health facility. Um, and he's the person who popularized what's called the transorbital lobotomy, which is a, you know, it's, it's a type of lobotomy that can be done without anesthesia and through the eye socket essentially. And, you know, in the, in the forties and fifties and even, you know, into the early sixties, um, Freeman and doctors that he trained did thousands of these procedures. I mean, he would go, he himself would go to a veterans hospital and just lobotomize like 30 people in a day. Right. And so I did this piece on this guy um, and it got to the point where, you know, his archives are at GW here in DC. And I held and photographed his surgical instruments, you know, the ice pick he was using and stuff. And so, you know, then years passes by and I'm doing this, you know, Matt and I are doing this research on Willie and, and, find out that he was lobotomized and I found, you know, you, I find out that Walter Freeman trained the people who did these lobotomies at Mount Pleasant Mental Health Institute. And it's, it's bizarre how things intersect in life. You know what I mean? But I, I do think to your point, Tom, like the story very quickly became not a soccer story and it became uh, a story at least framed by sort of the failures of the American mental health system in those decades when they didn't have any antipsychotic medications. It, places like Mount Pleasant Mental Health Institute were just warehouses basically, you know what I mean? And uh, the people who ended up there uh, oftentimes weren't even mentally ill, it's just sort of like homes for just undesirable people, you know, generally speaking. Um, and it was, it, was, it was the hardest part about the piece was sort of wading through all of this. I mean, there's dozens of interviews we didn't use from people who treated Willie at Pine Knoll and at, um, uh, you know, who, who spoke to how the patients that underwent lobotomy, electroshock therapy, all these things, how they fared, what caring for them was like. Um, it was, it was just like an institutional failure. I mean, between the Great Depression and the American mental health system, this guy's and all of his concussions, uh, this guy just like never had a chance, basically. You know what I mean? And we touched earlier on the stuff that kind of got cut out and, and the stuff that we kind of left on the cutting room floor. I think where we could have expounded at the greatest length is is on this. 
um, just the state of mental health um, and the way that it was treated at that time. I mean, even for his own family members, I think it was it was easier to kind of put it out of sight, out of mind. Um, and that was kind of, I think, Pablo had written the line in our intro where he referred to uh, Mount Pleasant as like a warehouse for the unwanted. Um, and I do think that that is kind of what it was. It was these people who were chewed up by the depression and society at that time. And, and there was maybe that lack of either awareness or the wherewithal or the desire to sort of deal with it. Um, it was sort of just like kind of just lost in the darkness. And that was what became a big part of our mission for this story was to at least sort of like drag at least one person's story into the light. Um, and I'm really glad that it was able to at long last kind of come out and, and hopefully resonate with at least some people. And like, I think I'll, one thing I'll add quickly, um, again, I'm sorry to go on about this, but something again that didn't end up at length in the piece at least we got a letter further down in our research from one of these family members it was written from mount pleasant mental health institute to willie's brother in the 50s and um it's recommending that he be discharged you know it's saying that like hey you know like he's we consider him you know like manageable um you know one of his family members could could possibly like come and get him but then it goes on to say that, you know, the doctor in the letter says, you know, I've spoken with Willie at length, though, and it's very clear that, like, the institution's become his home. You know, he says he doesn't want to leave, he doesn't want to be a burden on anybody, he doesn't want to, um, you know, do X, Y, and Z thing, and he's just fully a fully institutionalized patient at that point. You know, so, again, I think once you spend years of your life in a place like that, um, it becomes hard to even wrap your head around the idea of becoming a functional member of society again. I think that's sort of, at the end of the day, why Willie lived all those years. I mean, he died in a facility in Iowa where he eventually became the groundskeeper at the place. Um, you know, so I think that that probably helped give him a sense of purpose and stuff, but I don't think he was ever in a place to, to kind of rejoin society as a whole. Any other uh, final questions, parting shots? Looks like this, Gabe uh, had a question there. Oh, Gabe, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, I do. Uh, gentlemen, thanks for your research on this. I look forward to reading the article a lot more closely. Uh, I have a couple of questions. One, how did he get, how did his uh, body get out to Calumet from Iowa? Two, you offhandedly mentioned the Canadian club that he had a stint with them. And that's a really underdocumented club in Chicago. And if you have any more, you could speak of that. And then third, Pablo, you kind of offhandedly mentioned the love triangle. And I am familiar with the love triangle that took place with documentation on the Sticks team. But the it Billy, didn't the Billy Gonzalez and yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The Gonzalez that, that, one, right. So I mean that was my my assumption was maybe this family member Willie's had sort of like confused that with or the, like you know, it, yeah exactly right the um because that, that was the one where they switched or you know like the one player ended up marrying the the then ex-wife of the other player correct right yeah, yeah. and that yeah. kind of was his exile from st louis into chicago yeah um yeah. canadian club i honestly couldn't really scare much up on like you said it's just a, a club that was barely in the papers from the time. And like so much of our research as far as Willie's playing days um, was as simple as just uh, looking through old newspaper clippings, you know? Yeah. Um, okay. The other question. I How did his body get out to uh, Calumet? Oh. Well, he had, um, so his family lived in Chicago and in Indiana Harbor and whatnot. Yeah, you know, Willie was in Davenport because that's where he ran away to. Um, sure. To expand on that really briefly, uh, you know, he changed his name, he ran away to Davenport, he remarried, you know, he married another woman. Um, and then after a few years, he had another breakdown and try actually tried to kill his second wife. That's actually what led to him being institutionalized. So at that point, he was going to be in Iowa for the rest of his life, basically. Um, and what I gather is, you know, this is another sort of bizarre part of this whole mystery is, 
um, Willie's family, Willie was legitimately lost the world for about six or seven years. Then at some point, his brother Daniel in the 50s tracked him down. So at that point, his family knew where he was, right? And sort of actively hid him from his wife and child, right? Um, but once he died, you know, I my assumption is that his family got his body back to the Chicago area and buried it there because that's where they were living, you know? Yeah, and even it kind of came full circle because the Archibald McKinley story that kind of started our research, I think that it's sort of even implied by the line that like we brought him home to bury him in Calumet Park. So I, I my assumption is that the family had, had sort of made that effort to bring him back to where they were. Right outside of Pullman. Yeah. We start. Great article, gentlemen, and thanks for your research and contributing to the story. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Th thank you Gabe. Any other final parting shots? Uh, we can turn it um, over, you know, to, to Pablo and Matt. Any, any final comment uh, that you'd like? I, I mean, I'd love to hear that uh, a book project is in the works. Uh, you know, th that's amazing because that's one of the things that kind of screamed at me, you know, when I read an earlier draft, I, I read the, the final draft and then now listening to you, uh, you know, in, in front of us that, yeah, it, it, it definitely, can can be a, a book project so we got a week that, that vein by the way of st louis soccer obviously is so huge that uh there's so much to dig into there you know what i mean that was the other thing it was, it was just like our research on this person in that city in particular you know it was like the sort of fully developed soccer scene that you just didn't see other where you know in, in other places the coverage of it the you know, the attendance at games, stuff like that. I mean, it's sort of one of those places like Kearney, right, where um, where it just seemed like it was this pocket where it was wildly, wildly popular for many years, you know. So I would love to even dig into that more. Not, I mean, plenty has been written on St. Louis soccer, obviously, but this could be another, another chapter in that book, you know. Agreed. Well, on behalf of the society, uh, just love to thank you for joining us, you know, a week after uh, it's released. If uh, you haven't read it yet, um, please do. Uh, chock full of uh, unbelievable storytelling and research. Uh, and if you need incentive to uh, get an athletic subscription, you know, th this, is, this is certainly it. Um, and we hope to see more stories uh, like this in the future. So thanks for joining us. Uh, this will be up on the website. Uh, Cheers to all. See you at the next session. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody.